caring greyhounds and the promise of the idealized encounter so i will hand over to kerry thanks very much louise and everyone um i'm just gonna share my screen and i'll be with you in a second okay hi everyone so i'm kerry um i'm a phd student at exeter like lots of the organizers today um in the uk and I'm just about to submit my PhD thesis, which is a multi-species ethnography, which has examined um, some of the lives and experiences of some of the dogs, some of the greyhounds leaving the racing industry in the UK. I've also looked at the people who are caring for and about them and examined some of the so socio-political issues facing activists who are trying to leverage change for this population of dogs. So... Um, the title of my talk today is Caring Greyhounds and the Promise of the Idealised Encounter. So this is a chapter from my thesis, which explores how the homogenization of greyhounds by social actors from across the spectrum of racing and rescue are converging, interestingly, around this idea of an idealized encounter. Um, all photos in the presentation are taken by me unless otherwise specified. All right, so what am I gonna cover today? Okay. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to start with a little bit of background, just for those of you not familiar with um, greyhound racing and kind of how the modern greyhound has kind of come into existence. So I'll do a little bit on the historical context and the current picture. I'm then going to um, just mention the normalization of the recycle of greyhounds from the racing industry to the pet market, which has been happening for around the past 50 years. I'm going to then examine how greyhounds are homogeneously imagined as caring dogs to soothe a range of different human discontents. And I'll be bringing in some examples of programs and practices that I've encountered through my research. I'll be critiquing some of the myths and tropes that underpin this notion of the caring greyhound. And then I'll hopefully be finishing off by convincing you of the malevolence of this and how ultimately it de-individuates greyhounds and serves the racing industry's interests in reproducing itself and continuing to demonstrate its social license to operate. Hopefully I'll be able to convince you of that by the end of my um, session today. All right, so let's start with a bit of background then. So greyhounds are a breed of domestic dog. They've been around for several thousand years, um, but actually they've been bred specifically for um, the commercial racing industry for around the last 100 years. So the commercial racing industry is an animal use industry which relies on the professionalised racing of dogs for financial reward. So globally, it's thought to be in decline. It used to be kind of much more popular as a, a human entertainment activity and a spectator sport than it is currently. But it is currently still operational in five countries around the world. And you can see in the map on the right hand side there where those countries are. So we've got the US, Australia, New Zealand, the UK, which is where my research has taken place, and the Republic of Ireland. And in the UK, there are active um, racetracks in three out of four of the UK nations. So in England, Wales and in Scotland, nothing in Northern Ireland at the moment. So in recent years, it's become really politically salient. Um, there's been um, a number of uh, exposés uh, around the, the a number of controversies um, and animal welfare concerns uh, around kind of what happens to the dogs within greyhound racing. And it's also been very turbulent. So there's been a number of um, discussions and arguments about whether greyhound racing should be continuing in, in each of these kind of places and these locations. In the UK, there's currently active campaigns in England, Scotland and Wales, although legislative change does seem to be pretty slow. Um, Wales and Scotland actually um, conducted a a, a public consultation on the legitimacy of greyhound racing, um, which closed this year. And we're waiting for the outcome of that with the respective governments. In Australia, uh, I think it was back in 2017, the Premier of New South Wales actually instituted a ban on greyhound racing, but then backflipped on this. And so uh, racing is still active and legal there, as it is in those other countries indicated there. So the average span for greyhounds, a lifespan even, is 12 to 14 years, um, which is pretty typical of the dogs of that size. But most racing greyhounds finish by the finish racing by the time they're age three or four years old. So this does leave a bit of a quandary for the racing industry in terms of what happens with these dogs post-racing. 
So this is my only theory slide, really, just to kind of, in case you're interested in, in, in those who have commentated on greyhound racing and on the harms of greyhound racing, then I've just listed a number of scholars that are worth engaging with. This isn't a comprehensive list, but it just relates to some of the, the theorists that I have sort of brought into my research. So Atkinson and Young, they conceptualized greyhound racing as sport-related violence, and they came up with this notion of the greyhound racing figuration through which they identified a system of overlapping power players. So they were the first ones really to inspire me to really think about kind of greyhounds racing as part of a, a bigger whole. So they identified greyhound racing social actors and greyhound rescue social actors as being part of, of you know, of the same whole. Uh, anthropologist then Raymond Madden uh, looked at the rescuing of greyhounds from the racing industry, um, amongst other things in his paper, and noted that this was a significant issue that, you know, continued to require attention. Then much more recently, Justine Groziard in, in Australia conducted research looking at um, greyhound racing participants, so looking anthropocentrically at um, those involved in racing in Australia. And one of the things that she noted was that there was a need for much more research on the two factions of racing and rescue. And then more recently, uh, more political sort of commentary has come from Stephen Zet al. in New Zealand and Arkari um, in the UK. Um, so Stephen Zet et al. really was looking at greyhound rehoming and considering um, these practices as um, in relation to kind of capitalism and really sort of conceptualize the unwanted greyhounds leaving the rehoming, leaving the racing industry as a sentient surplus. And then Akari examined a really interesting paper, actually examining um, greyhound racing husbandry practices as slow violence. So these have all really fed into my research and into some of the things that I'm discussing today. All right, so let's have a bit of a think about the trajectories then for racing dogs. And it's a bit of a tale of two halves. So historically, surplus racing dogs were killed or abandoned by the racing industry. And this was a bit of an open secret, I guess, of um, commercial racing practice. Um, there were a couple, there were a number of different controversies that occurred, but I've just pulled out a few here in relation to the UK. So back in the early noughties, um, two seminal events really um, stopped the racing industry in its tracks and really forced them to consider the, the lives of these dogs in a post-racing context. So one was something that happened in Wales, which is a news report you can see on the left there. And then another incident was the discovery of mass greyhound graves in the northeast of England in 2006 which really signified that the racing industry were um, killing and abandoning these dogs in, in, in great numbers. So the Greyhound Trust is um, the Greyhound Racing Industry's uh, rehoming partner and has been in existence since the late 1970s. Um, uh, but since uh, certainly over the last uh, sort of 30 years or so, we've really seen a massive in increase in the number of greyhounds being rehomed as domestic companions or pets. Um, and now this is a multi-million pound enterprise in its own right. In fact, um, the Greyhound Trust is the official racing industry charitable rehoming partner and recorded an annual income of 3.5 million in 2022. So we're really seeing the racing industry through its own activities and through the activities of its official rehoming partner. We're really seeing it attending to the post-racing lives of greyhounds because it's realised this is critical if greyhound racing is to position itself as ethically justifiable. So this really sort of underpins um, the whole notion of um, the care in greyhound, which I'm going to come on to in a moment. So just kind of continuing with uh, with trying to set the scene here. What we also have seen, and this is kind of across the 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 scope of my PhD, I started my PhD in 2017. So um, this has been happening across the, the time that that I've been conducting my research. We've really seen the racing industry regulator, which is called the Greyhound Board of Great Britain, really starting to attend to um, the, the post-racing lives of these dogs. So it began in 2018 with um, its eight pledge Greyhound commitment. And I've just circled there the shift in emphasis. So there's an emphasis on retirement and there's an emphasis on attending to the public's perception of greyhounds. So we can really see these kind of structural and systemic shifts. Um, and also uh, some narrative from the racing industry regulator describing greyhounds as calm, gentle and lovable pets. 
And this continued then in 2022 and 2023 with the launch of their Good Life for Every Greyhound long-term strategy, which for the first time really uh, utilised the language of animal welfare science, the five domains of animal welfare and the language of safeguarding as well to reflect its apparent continued interest in the full lives of these dogs. So why is this happening then? Why are, is the racing industry suddenly interested in the lives of these dogs in a post-racing context? Well, there's been a real interest um, sort of uh, uh, academically, but also sort of pragmatically in rehoming animals. So McKee wrote about this in relation to ex racehorses in the US. And she conducted an ethnography of a rehabilitative program involving horses and incarcerated men in a US prison. And she came up with this concept of redemptive capital and the, the idea of the notion that certain animals have redemptive capital. Um, and she described this as the criteria used to deem a life too valuable to be killable. And I guess this is what we're seeing really with surplus greyhounds, with the sentient surplus from the racing industry, is that we're seeing the racing industry recognising that these lives are too valuable to be killable. So what qualities then make these dogs too valuable to be killable? Well, I just want to draw on some greyhound rescue mythologies here, which have really emerged alongside the um, the way that the public have really adopted greyhounds as pets. So this is kind of an, another aspect of my research. I've really sort of problematized these mythologies, but we've really seen greyhound adoption manifesting this notion of the lazy, calm, gentle greyhound. And we see various um, animal welfare charities really discussing the benefits of adopting greyhounds as pets by drawing on these tropes. You know, and anyone who's encountered a greyhound in person will likely be able to also recount a, a version of this trope. And the truth is that these dogs do seem to have curious behaviours. And this dog was um, one that I encountered um, as part of uh, my master's research. Um, and this dog uh, chose to lay down in the mi middle of a busy street, a, a charity street fundraising event. And this behaviour was described to me by his caregiver on account of this dog's laziness. Um, and, but these kinds of mythologies are problematic because they don't allow for the consideration of other possibilities for these kinds of behaviours. You know, for example, note here that the dogs in this image, I don't know whether you can see it clearly, but this dog's eyes are open and the gaze is fixed. So it does really require a reconsideration. Coming back then to the racing industry, um, you know, we've really seen this trajectory of interest in retirement or you know, uh, what they term as retirement um, and also in the post racing lives of these dogs. And what we're seeing in 2024 is the launch of a campaign to uh, position greyhounds as idealized pets. Um, and what we're really seeing then, if we draw on McKee's notion of redemptive capital, is that emotionality is replacing the physicality as a desirable commodity for the racing industry. So we're really seeing then this convergence of narratives by the greyhound racing industry and the greyhound rescue actors around this notion of a caring greyhound as, as a dog with these kind of qualities that, that make them really ideal for this post-racing setting for, you know, for this kind of, and really making these dogs kind of emotionally salient. And this is really the precursor to this notion of greyhounds as caring animals. So I just want to um, move in the last bit of my talk today to give some examples of where I've encountered the caring greyhound um, through my research. So I'm just going to pull some, um, I'm just going to include some screenshots uh, of different um, iterations of the caring greyhound as well as sort of talk about where else I've encountered this. So to begin with then, caring greyhounds are really, um, the caring greyhound trope is really visible across animal rescue spaces. And I've certainly witnessed this in my research. So adopt, adoption groups often use this homogenized view of greyhounds in order to promote adoptions, which is what we're seeing in the screenshot on the left there. But this is particularly problematic when formerly um, injured racing greyhounds like Zed on the right hand side there are used to kind of spectacularize stories of struggle and overcoming adversity without the requisite attention to how these lived experiences have impacted how these dogs see the world. So we're getting this proliferation of feel good stories without a real recognition of the, the kind of real relational impacts of being injured or being rejected by the industry. Uh, 
also we're seeing hearing greyhounds really in or, or greyhounds increasingly imagined as therapy dogs in order to soothe a range of uh, human discontents um programs that are being promoted by the industry rehoming partner so this is a screenshot from um, a facebook page of the greyhound trust talking about um greyhounds being registered as pets as therapy dogs um, and we also see promotion of greyhounds as therapeutic aids by the racing regulator themselves. But again, these programs are anthropocentric and they do very little to consider the biographical histories of these dogs who've also often lived, you know, incredibly insular lives without exposure to the kinds of things that are going to be expected of them as therapy dogs. And this is something that's really important to note. And then a final example um, is uh, the way that caring greyhounds are increasingly um, covering over structural harms through a number of racing industry affiliated greyhound retraining programs in total institutions like prisons. And this is a screen um, grab here of um, one particular example, um, a documentary called Prisoners and Pups. Uh, and these are particularly problematic because they gl glamorize human vulnerability on some level, and they also use punitive and coercive methods to pressurize incarcerated women to turn institutionalized racing greyhounds into perfect pets in unrealistic timeframes, which is kind of one of the themes that we see um, in this particular documentary. And the thing to remember here is when we can when we're considering the ethics or reconsidering the ethics of these programs is we have to consider the origin stories of this population of dogs. Right. Because the main um, objective of commercial racing is simply to produce dogs who will chase a mechanical lure for no reward. Okay? That's the main objective of the commercial racing industry. But I argue that a second, altogether less examined um, objective is to breed um, biddable, tractable dogs who will tolerate, and that's something important to highlight here, tolerate coercive handling. You know, great, racing greyhounds have to be lifted into traps and they have to be lifted into stackable crates in vehicles and kennels. So the industry have to breed dogs who will tolerate this. So thinking about this is really important in consideration of the structural and relational harms that are perpetrated against greyhounds in a post-racing setting. Um, and it is really important for us to consider this when we consider um, how dogs that are placed in situations where they're kind of imagined as caring greyhounds, you know, how they're really encountering that kind of situation. And this is my um, penultimate slide. <laughs> So I just want to kind of bring in this image here. This isn't an image that I took, but it's actually a, one that I found on a Facebook group. I won't name the the particular uh, therapy program that it was advertising because I just want to protect their identity. And actually, this is pretty typical of, um, of what we see at a therapeutic encounter. But, you know, we need to remember how these structural harms in, inform a reanalysis of the, the caring greyhound. You know, how does describing greyhounds as lazy, calm and gentle and how does this work from the human's perspective? Um, and it's really important for us to consider greyhound perspectives in these encounters. And maybe you can get a sense of, of the, the fact that I'm trying to do that from this image here. So. You know, I'd just like to invite you to take the Greyhound's perspective of this encounter if you can. Think about their experience, notice their body language, you know, be critically anthropomorphic if you can. So that means really connect with your own perceptiveness of this encounter and seek out the inner, wo in, inner emotional world of this dog if you can. You know, how do you think they're experiencing being a caring Greyhound? Before we um, hold up particular breeds or species or individuals as suitable for these encounters, we have a moral and ethical duty to really drop into their perspectives. And, you know, for ex-racing greyhounds who are routinely and poorly socialised to life outside of racing, you know, how are they encountering these particular um, therapeutic settings? And so my final slide for today is just to encourage a reframe then of this idealized encounter. You know, Raymond Madden described how people think about, write about and picture greyhounds as what he described as the greyhound imaginary. And this has undergone huge shifts in the last 50 years from just imagining these dogs as just racing kind of machines to increasingly thinking about them as domestic companions. 
However, if we through the through the curation of the idealized encounter, we're really at risk of just simply replacing one kind of exploitation with another, because modern iterations of the caring greyhound just do very little apart from weaponize greyhound vulnerability because they distort and distract us from the reality of the experiences of these dogs and do little to advance efforts to prevent greyhound exploitation. Indeed, through, you know, through the, the notion of the idealized encounter and through kind of imagining greyhounds as caring dogs, we're actually providing the racing industry with more materials so that it can continue to reproduce itself. OK, I think I've gone right up to time, but thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for listening. Sorry if I really um, trotted through that super quickly, but I'm really happy to chat about anything further. So you can ask me some questions or you can get in touch. I don't really use social media, but you can get in touch um, using my email address and I'd be happy to chat to you. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks so much, Kerry. It's really nice to get your perspective on that. All right, so our next speaker is Philippe Pimentel-Rassos, a master student from Nova University of Lisbon. Philippe's talk is on making peace with predators, relations between humans, wolves and dogs in central Portugal. Thank you, Philippe. Hello, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon. Um, I'll just share my screen with you. So thank you so much for, for having me. Um, I'm a, a master's student uh, in anthropology in Portugal, uh, and my uh, dissertation uh, has been about the coexistence scenarios in uh, central Portugal, uh, mainly the relations between humans, uh, shepherds and livestock, livestock breeders, uh, wolves and uh, livestock guarding dogs. Um, I think one of my supervisors is here, so <laughs> thank you. Um, so let's just get on with it. Um, so this project was supported by Grupo Lobo and Rewilding Portugal mainly, uh, and also with the, the Center for um, Research in Anthropology uh, and uh, ICA, ICNF, which is the National uh, Agency for Nature Conservation in Portugal, and uh, the Association for the, the Conservation of the Iberian, Iberian Wolf Habitat. Um, my work, uh, which is uh, basically a, a, a sum of, of my dissertation, um, mainly occurred in two projects, which is uh, Life Wolflux, coordinated by Rewilding Portugal. Um, it aimed at reducing socio-ecological um, barriers to wolf connectivity south of the Douro River, focusing on uh, parishes um, in, in that region and also with the project uh, coordinated by Group Lobo co um, called Supporting the Coexistence in Iberian Wolf Habitat, Assessing Social Impact of Livestock Guarding Dogs. Um, that impact mainly uh, on nature, tourism and sports, but also on human communities uh, generally. And uh, it focused on the Freita and Arada Mountains in Central Port. So uh, just a bit of background. So uh, south of the Douro River, uh, it has a decreased human population um, in the last uh, 10 years, but much longer than that. Um, it has a reduction in the number of sheep and goats uh, and a slight increase in, in cattle due to uh, agric a common agricultural policy uh, incentive. Um, the work conducted there uh, um, was, uh, was done in three districts, so Guarda, Viseu e Aveiro. Uh, shrubland, agricultural fields and forested areas are the most significant land uses and with uh, small properties, most of them less than five hectares. Um, it, it is also home of the most threatened Iberian wolf subpopulation in Portugal. So there is six identified packs, packs um, uh, according to the latest research, one less than uh, previous uh, studies in 2013. Um, and it is isolated from the rest of the Iberian population and is composed of about 30 to 40 wolves. Um, and this study area is also com uh, con constituted by around 60% of classified areas uh, integrated in the Nat Natura 2000 network. 
So this is uh, a map of the the area of the Wolflux, Wolflux project. Um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but uh, these little icons here were the regions where I've conducted uh, interviews or assisted in interviews with my supervisors and colleagues from the project. Um, this little goat icon here uh, is the region of the Serra, the Freita and Arada Mountains, uh, where I have done uh, uh, in situ observations and I accompanied uh, shepherds and uh, goats, sheep, cows, and of course, uh, dogs through their uh, grazing routes. Um, so the, the Freight and Rada Mountains is where I've uh, focused a little bit of my, my work. Um, it, it's about part of Natura 2000, it's a special conservation zone, uh, around 20,000 hectares, mountainous area, and in some point it, it can reach uh, 1,000 meters above sea level. Shrubland and coniferous forest are the main land covers, um, as in other rural areas, not only in Portugal, but across Europe. Uh, it has an aging, aging human population and agriculture and livestock breeding uh, are the main economic vectors. Uh, and there is one wolf pack confirmed there, still confirmed there, uh, the Arada Trancoso pack. So this is a map in Portugal, it's right on the edge of the northern region and the central region. Um, and on the right, uh, this is Serra da Freita, uh, the Freita mountain. Uh, and there's these three villages here where I've uh, conducted field work, uh, talked to uh, livestock uh, uh, breeders and uh, also with shepherds and other uh, local uh, residents. Um, about the wolves and the, the dogs. So the objectives of my work, which coincide with my thesis, with my dissertation, were to document ethnozoological knowledge of wolves and life protection do uh, livestock protection dogs, to describe the behavior and movements of uh, LPDs on routes, uh, meaning on, on grazing uh, trajectories, and interactions between shepherds and LPDs, and also the dogs, sheep, goats, and cows. Um, also to understand uh, the social places attributed by people to humans and, and the dogs, to understand human conflicts surrounding uh, wolves and LPDs, and to identify challenges to the recovery of uh, dogs as human wildlife conflict mitigation measures. So uh, in Wolf Looks, we, we've done semi-structured interviews with uh, 50 livestock breeders, in 20 parishes in, uh, south of the Douro River uh, to assess local knowledge and attitudes um, towards wolves uh, and also um, towards livestock protection measures, attitudes uh, about nature and conservation projects as well. And the second phase was done in the, the livestock protection dog project uh, and in, in, encompassed uh, in situ observations, uh, accompanying flocks, shepherds and LPDs informal conversations with shepherds um, in the middle of the mountains and register and interpret interspecies interactions. All of this was made uh, following a uh, multi and interspecies approach and, uh, and uh, multidisciplinarity. Um, I draw from anthropology, ecology and ethology. So the main results uh, about eth uh, ethnozoological knowledge about wolves um, this is a perspective, an anthropocentric perspective, of course, about the, the, how people that coexist with wolves see the wolves. Um, and they, they exhibited a, a wide range of diverse knowledge of how wolves live, um, what they eat, how they hunt, how they move, um, an emphasis on predatory traits uh, as a voracious, voracious predator, uh, also about surplus killing, which is an ecology term for uh, killing more animals than they consume. This is the, the, the human perspective uh, that portrays the wolf as a uh, voracious killer um, that uh, kills more than they actually consume. Um, and they also uh, portray the, the wolf as an, in, an intelligent animal, a cunning animal, uh, there are also suggestions of agency that they affect and can be affected by others, and of also morality. Uh, adjectives such as killer, assassin, thief, 
uh, are common to describe wolves. Um, and one of our uh, informants also said that nothing, there is nothing good on its soul, um, which uh, echoes some other perspective. There are also uh, emphasis on extra natural traits, even though they're not as frequent. Uh, there are some people that say that wolves, if you cross their path, they can steal their voice. You go uh, voiceless. And that extends to dogs as well. Um, they have a poisonous bite and they are blood sucking animals. Uh, the, the, this vampiric behavior has also been registered in other predator species in Portugal, such as the lynx. Um, the wolves are viewed as transgressors in human spaces, as animals out of place. Uh, about the, the livestock protection dogs, um, the, the shepherds and livestock breeders say that they intimidate by size. Um, they bark to alert intruders, they, they chase away wolves. Um, protector is the main category here when they describe livestock, livestock protection dogs. They keep the boundary between what is wild and domestic, between what is human and what is wolf. So they protect against the, the, the wolf transgressor. Um, livestock protection dogs are also re recognized as potential uh, predators. So there's a dual characterization here um, as a protector and occasional transgressor with some people uh, reporting um, li uh, livestock uh, protection dog attacks uh, on, on livestock itself. Uh, it can happen when the dogs are little and they play a bit roughly. Uh, or also uh, when they are a bit uh, mature. Um, the knowledge, there is the recognition that the knowledge of how to train and use LPDs is being lost south of the Dura River, which can sometimes lead, uh, according to some authors, to unexpected behaviors and problems with humans and other non-human animals. There is also something interesting that we noted that is there's a recognition of the similarities um, between wolves and dogs. Uh, I remember uh, anthropologist Pat Shipman in the book about the origin of the dog. She says that wolves and dogs share a dogginess, a dogginess which is uh, uh, a set of traits that make people um, uh, think that they are close, um, close uh, in evolutionary terms or phylogenetic terms. So uh, our informants uh, say that they are they have a similar body type, but they are different in the way that, for instance, wolves have longer snouts and pointier ears, uh, and also in the fur color. They also say that wolves are more intelligent than dogs, um, and wolves bite prey uh, preys on the throat, uh, while dogs bite where they can. So there's this uh, this distinction here about how wolves predate. Uh, other animals that is very interesting. Um, dogs are, are used as the, the main reference point from which to, to describe wolves. In fact, it was the, the, the word most used by our informants to describe the wolf. Um, there is also the perception and belief that wolves today are different from the wolves of the past. Um, they say that they, they have a different behavior, the wolves today, uh, they are less wild. Uh, they are more inclined to get closer to humans. Um, and this leads to, uh, we will approach it uh, later on, but this leads to narratives of uh, and beliefs of wolf reintroductions in Portugal, which have never happened. Um, and uh, they say that the wolves bred in captivity, um, which does not happen, uh, are less, uh, natural than the, 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 the actual wolves, the actual Iberian wolf. Um, this can be interpreted as some sort of loss of knowledge about the species and contact with the species, or as a tactic of resistance against wolf conservation, uh, pointing out that supposed efforts to breed wolves in captivity cannot produce wolves as good as the true wolves, the natural wolves. Um, regarding the importance of the dogs to protect against predators and to increase tolerance uh, towards wolves, uh, over half of our informants recognize that the, the livestock protection dogs are actually important to, to protect from predators. 
Uh, a minority, about 15%, thinks LPDs are not significant to prevent wolf attacks. Uh, and that's, this can be justified by the fact that some of these people think that um, wolves are smarter, are fiercer uh, than dogs, and that dogs cannot pose a challenge to uh, the predator. Um, and in some villages where uh, I've conducted field work with my colleagues, uh, there is no memory of the use of uh, LPDs, either by their parents or grandparents, um, which is uh, which can be interesting when we analyze the the, the dog as a, an ancient uh, measure of protection against uh, predators. Uh, and there is also no significant influence in the tolerance toward wolves uh, from people with livestock protection dogs and people without, the, lev the levels of intolerance are pretty much the same. Um, we have also identified conflicts between humans uh, around wolves and dogs. Um, the, our informants feel that they have to have and support LPGs because of wolf conservation. They think it's one more thing that I have to pay for and spend time on uh, because of efforts to, uh, to preserve uh, the wolves. Uh, local populations sometimes say that wolves have more support um, than they do from the state, um, even though there are financial support to farmers and livestock breeders. Um, they say that wolf conservation is tightening pastoral and livestock breeding communities with extinction. We have actually uh, heard that uh, comparison once or twice, that is, wolves are in danger of extinction, and so are we. Um, there are conspiracy narratives about the secret reintroductions we talked uh, before. Um, they are widespread, and uh, I've read that they are uh, identified in other uh, European contexts. Um, there's a sh there seems to be a shift of responsibility for livestock protection to, to those, uh, quotation, to those uh, who want the wolves. Um, some type, some uh, shepherds and livestock breeders think that they should not have to, uh, to, to spend money and time um, with the LPDs, with these dogs, uh, and that, that responsibility should fall uh, on those uh, on conservationists not just try to, to conserve the wolves. Um, and all this can be seen as resistance narratives against wolf presence um, and a way to call attention to the hardships these communities feel. Uh, in a second phase of my work, uh, I accompanied uh, flocks and, and shepherds and dogs through the mountains. Um, I call them observation groups. Uh, they have distinct uh, compositions. Um, none of the, the main conclusions is that no, none of these shepherds actually remembers having um, livestock dogs in their villages uh, when they were younger. More sh they used to have more shepherds to protect flocks, and there was also some hunting dogs um, that went with the shepherds to the to the to the mountains, and they could function as well as uh, a measure of protection in a way that they alert to the the, the approaching uh, threat, being human or non-human. Um, so some life some li uh, the the life of protection dogs are seen as something new uh, that is being introduced due to wolf conservation efforts um, and also to access compensation payments for livestock losses in Portugal. Uh, you can be compensated for the loss of an animal uh, due to the predation by wolves, but only if you meet one of two criteria. Either you have a livestock protection dog or you have a fence. Um, in my observations, I also uh, verified that the, the livestock protection dogs, they have an autonomy uh, towards the shepherd. There is no actual direct communication between them. So the dogs just do their, their thing. Um, they roam freely around in the midst of the flock. Uh, there can be many dozens of meters between them and the shepherd when they're on the field. Um, the dogs go around sniffing the air, the ground, marking the terrain with urine, uh, urine and feces, interact with one another, and sometimes play. Um, there seems to be a familiarity 
um, and some trust between uh, the dogs and the, the goats, the sheep and the cows. Um, there's no visible reactions of fear or, or unease in either of them. Um, in some instances, uh, I've seen uh, dogs smelling the faces of goats and sheep, which is a sign of uh, familiarity and uh, trust. Um, and in the summer, which is when I have done most of my field work, uh, the dogs could get a bit farther from the flock and from the shepherd to uh, search for shade, to cool off, um, which can probably increase the vulnerability of the flock. Um, there are also challenges in circulation because of infra infrastructure. Even though these villages are remote, they are not as isolated as before. There's, there are uh, roads. Uh, there are tourism there, so it gets a lot of uh, visitors from the outside. Uh, in one instance, I saw uh, one of the groups crossing uh, busy roads, so the, the, the sheep and the goats were crossing the road, and there was a line, big line of about 10 cars waiting for them to uh, finish, to go to the other side. Um, but the shepherd didn't do anything to, to actually change or ease the situation, uh, which I thought was some form of resistance as well, because he said roads were here before there were roads and cars. Uh, despite the, the, the autonomy of the dogs, uh, which is also recognized by the shepherds, um, the shepherds seem to have some expectations about the dogs following the flock, even without instructions to do so. Um, one of them said that he would just open the barn and the dogs would immediately prepare uh, to follow the group. So there's an expectation of what the dog is supposed to do. So this, I'm going to go faster. Um, this is one dog of one of the groups in, in uh, Preta Mountain. It's the same dog. It's a mature male of about three years old. Um, as you, I don't know if you can see, but he has a spiked collar, which is an ancient mechanism to prevent the dog from getting injured in case of attack. Uh, and you can see that the, the sheep and the the goats, they're very comfortable around the dog and the dog with them as well. So this observation group has three dogs. These two, the male and the juvenile female, they always go uh, together. Um, and the third dog, which the shepherd says is the more alert one, the more effective one, he usually is uh, someplace else in the front of the flock and does not interact very much with them. So as you can see, the flock can disperse a lot in the mountains. Um, so it is important to, the shepherd is right here, I don't know if you can see on the right. Um, and the dogs just go circling around. Uh, the one of the dogs goes on the front and the other tends to be on the back uh, of the group. And the shepherd says that is important to uh, protect from all sides. There are the, the other two on the left uh, resting on the shade. And on the right, there are the three dogs um, with the two that usually are together uh, on the left of the picture. And on the right, the, the one that tends to separate already moving forward. This is another group. Um, one of the dogs resting in the shade in a hot August day. Um, and on the right, there are three of the, the dogs that go with this group. There are four. The other one is not in the picture. And you can see that the goats have to cross busy roads to, to go from the village to the mountain, which you can see on the, the right picture. This is another group which is only composed of cows and uh, dogs. There were no shepherd at the time. Uh, on the left picture, you can see that the life protection, uh, the livestock protection dog, is the female, uh, the big one, the the grey one. And on her left, you can see a small brown hunting dog, a female as well, which uh, tends to go with her to the field uh, and keep her company. Uh, I've heard that it can be a distraction because the the hunting dog is not protecting the livestock and it may distract the, the livestock protection dog from its duties. But we have seen them playing together, exploring the, the area together uh, away from the, the flock. 
this is uh, one livestock dog with its shepherd in the Arada mountain this time. Um, and on the right, you can see, I, well, I drew arrows in the circle because you can actually see the animals. Uh, the, the blue arrows uh, signify the movement of the, the, the flock, which divided into two uh, columns and the dog, uh, the green circle, um, is, uh, is heading one of the columns, which can be problematic uh, because in this uh, kind of terrain, very steep and very hard, uh, it's easy for goats, but for dogs, not so much. Um, and it's important to have multiple dogs to protect um, not only not only the flocks, but, but each other in case of predatory attack. This is the, the last group, um, which the dog is, is different from the other ones because it's not a recognizable livestock protection breed. Um, and it lives inside the house with, with the shepherd um, and sleeps inside the house. And you can see on the right, the, the flock this uh, orange circle here, the flock is very far away from where I'm standing, which is the, the, the path, the, the marked path in the mountain. Um, and the dog was not with the, the flock that time because he had a swollen toe and he were, it was uh, taken care of uh, uh, at home. So the way forward and then to conclude, um, we think that uh, it's needed uh, more community involvement and direct contact between the populations where uh, conservation actions occur and the actions themselves. To avoid narratives of secret reintroductions and feelings of abandonment and imposition. There's also a need of re rethinking and complementary measures to comp compensation schemes. We've heard a lot of complaints uh, about that uh, the, the delays of the payments, that they are unfair, that they do not cover um, the actual financial and also emotional losses um, suffered by, by the, the humans. Um, and there can also be something uh, like a payment for e ecosystem services uh, regarding the wolf. We can see that with uh, pollination services in agriculture, and we think that it could also be tested uh, regarding the wolf as a natural uh, agent that control uh, population of wild ungulates. Um, there, there's need for further studies of LPDs, how LPDs live, how they are integrated into human communities, uh, how they are perceived by those local communities, what impact do they have on humans and other non-humans, and recognizing, uh, recognizing them as lively agents um, that uh, also have interests and individuality. There, are also, there might also be some challenges about uh, reviving the, the dogs as protection measures. Um, in modern times, uh, it, it is, the LPDs are, are promoted as a, an ancestral uh, um, measure uh, in pastoral and livestock uh, communities. But the fact is that those communities have changed a lot uh, and there are some challenges that need to be addressed um, to actually uh, protect both humans and non-humans and to, bet to promote a better e uh, effectiveness um, of these uh, interspecies relations and cooperation as well. So is the total harmonious coexistence possible? Can we ever make peace with predators? Uh, I, don't not, I do not have the answer. I don't think anyone does. Um, but it is important to understand that conflict is a part of coexistence, is not its opposite, is one of its uh, dimensions. Um, and it is also important to uh, try to understand it and to mitigate it to the, to the benefit of all humans and non-humans, wolves, dogs, sheep, cows, um, goats and humans as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philippe. That's a fascinating topic. And your visuals really helped us get a sense of the environment that this is taking place in. Um, so Valentin Yakleff from Escola Universitaria Vasco da Gama, Portugal, who is based in France. Um, Valentin's talk is the perceptions of caretakers on animal consciousness in wildlife conservation.
Hello, thank you. I will try to share my uh, my screen. So, um, good uh, good afternoon or good evening. Uh, my name is Valentin Yaklev, and I'm going to present you the work I realized with uh, Manuel Magalhães Santana, Ana Luisa Pereira, and Alexandre Acevedo, entitled "Perception of Caretakers on Animal Consciousness in Wildlife Conservation." I wanted to start this presentation by introducing you the dung beetle who, according to humans' criteria, is not uh, a really charismatic animal, but who has an important role in the ecosystem. <clears throat> it is important to distinguish and define three concepts present in this study. Cognition represents animals' capacity to assimilate and process information through perception, learning, and memory. It helps animals to adaptate and interact with their environment. Consciousness represents animals' abilities to be aware of experiences, whether they are subjective, perceptual, or affective, and it allows the animal to perceive their environment and experience subjective feelings such as pain and sadness and be aware of it. And consciousness represents animals' ability to be aware of exper uh, sorry, and finally, sentience uh, represent animals' capacity to feel and perceive. Over the century, there has been a growing belief in the animal mind and consciousness, which has influenced human attitudes towards animals. This belief in animal mind is influenced by animal species and tends to follow the phylogenetic scale based on the biological complexity of animals and phylogeny and the sociological scales based on the role animals play in humans' lives. <clears throat> the acknowledgement that animals possess different levels of consciousness and cognition raises questions about that treatment and has influenced the way humans treat animals for centuries. Uh, it has been shown that the attribution of resources for animal protection and conservation is influenced by humans' attitudes and affects towards animals and by species' charisma, with a bias towards large mammals and birds, even if other species are more numerous, more critical to the eco ecosystem functioning, or threatened. And uh, we also know that the human perception of animals' capabilities for cons cognition and consciousness directly, if directly influence the way they are treated. As people working in conservation centers walk closely to wild animals and are witness of their behavior and reaction, they were best positioned to assess consciousness capabilities of wild species. This is why the aim, the aim of this study was to understand how people working in wildlife conservation centers perceive the consciousness of the animals under their care with the objective to characterize the perception of caregivers and assess variation of the perception with species, demographics, factors, duration, and type of interaction. To do this, a cross-sectional study was realized through an online survey built on the Google Form platform targeted people working in conservation centers. The survey was directly emailed to 156 conservation centers and veterinarians uh, <clears throat> working in conservation across the world between the 20th of December 2023 and the 15th of March, March 2024. And before its dissem dissemination, the survey was piloted by two veterinarians one animal welfare specialist, and the other experience in wild and exotic animals. <clears throat> the survey was composed by four sections. The first were the uh, demographic question, then question about participant perception of the consciousness of a single species they most frequently work with, multiple choice question about the type and the frequency of interaction respondents had with the animals, to assess the human-animal relation. And the last section that I'm going to talk, uh, to focus on in this presentation, the multiple choice grid, aimed at assessing participant perception of animal consciousness in different selected uh, species. But does it make sense to say that some animals are more conscious than others? 
In fact, consciousness is, is a rich phenomenon which is best captured with a multidimensional approach based on dimension of, of consciousness that can lead to different types of species having, having different types of consciousness. For example, in this figure, we can see that for the uh, Corvids obtain a high score in the perceptual richness of the vision compared to the cephalopods, but cephalopods uh, obtain a higher score in perceptual richness of the touch compared to the corvid, and elephant obtain lower score in both dimensions. <clears throat> Those 10 dimensions of consciousness was used to formulate questions about participant perception of consciousness of a single species they most frequently work with. On the result obtained, a data cleaning was performed using Google Sheets, as well as the establishment of taxonomic levels, the calculation of the perception index, and stati statistical analysis were realized. N 92 responses spanning the five continents were obtained, with a total of 30 nationality and 27 country of residence. Five responses where participants choose multiple species or did not provide specific species name were included in demographics analysis, but excluded from descriptive and inferential analysis. There, were a, there was a larger representation of female respondents, age range from 25 to 54 years old, master or equivalent, and biologist, ecologist, and conservationist. To evaluate what factors influence the perception index, different candidate variables were tested, such as <clears throat> the country of residence, the age, the gender, the level of education, profession, number of years working with the species, taxonomic class of the species, and the frequency and type of the respondent interaction. And it has been shown that only the animal class and the level of education had an influence on the perception index. Globally, respondents working with mammals attribute higher perception index, followed by those working with birds, and finally those working with reptiles. And responses of respondents with a doctorate did not differ a lot from those with a master, but they attribute a significantly higher perception index than, than respondents with a bachelor or secondary education or less. To the question about participant perception of capabilities for consciousness for selected species, responses were assessed on a scale ranging from one as no consciousness to seven as a consciousness comparable to humans. And we can see that chimpanzee, elephant, dolphin obtained the highest scores. Raven obtained the highest scores among non-mammalian animals followed by the wolf and another non-mammalian animals, the common octopus. And the honeybee obtained a higher score than the other insects and then than the Atlantic salmon and the tree frog. And the lowest score were obtained by the housefly and the cockroach. Results show that participant perception of animals' capabilities for consciousness is influenced by the animal taxonomic class and the participant's level of education, which is interesting because other factors such as the age, the gender, the number of years working with the species, the profession and type of interaction were expected to influence human perception because of the difference in respondents' familiarity with their species, the capabilities to interpret the animal's behavior, and different bounds with the individual animals. But the common pro professional culture could base the statistical effect associated with the area of professional training. In general, the attribution of uh, dimension of consciousness followed what could be the expected pattern based on the phylogenetic scale, with gradually increased, increasing scores from insects to mammals. But there are some exceptions. For example, among the birds, the raven obtained high score, 
And that is particularly interesting because it belongs to the same order as the house sparrow. And the other exceptions are the wolf, the common octopus, and the honeybee. Explanation to this uh, exception can be the physical attractiveness, the larger size and resemblance to human, attribution of the status good or bad, as pets, vermin, predators or tools, and uh, species charisma, and the existence of scientific evidence. In the article, uh, Dimension of Consciousness, Birchnell and Clayton establish a hypothetical consciousness profile for elephants, raven, and octopus. And by comparing uh, with the results obtained in the study for the elephants, it was possible to observe that participants overestimated um, the capacities of consciousness of elephants. <clears throat> this overestimation is probably due to the anthropomorphic perspective, because our own human consciousness in the, is the only example that we can experience. An elaborate, understandable question to for a large audience was not an easy task, and for that reason, the complexity that may have persisted for some question may, may have biased the results. And as research target was very specific, the results should not be gen generalized to the other population. The perception of animal capabilities for consciousness varied on a broad scale with the taxonomy of the animals and the level of education of the respondents. And variation at, on a thinner scale can be explained with existence of scientific evidence, animals attributes, sociological factors, cultural factors, and characteristic of the respondent not captured in this study. In order to deepen the research on the subject, we can ask how to improve the understanding of the concept of consciousness, cognition, and sentience to reach a wider audience, and how to improve the knowledge of animal consciousness in reptile, fish, and insects, and how to align knowledge of animal consciousness with its perception. I want to thank uh, Manuel Magalier Santana, Ana Luisa Pereira, and Alexandra Zevedo for their help and support, and the organizer of this conference for their kindness and for the opportunity to present my work. Thank you for your attention.